Howdy. Even if you and I can't control what other people do in the future, we can at least control ourselves. So what sort of future should we be prepared for? What can we expect to happen to the foods we like in, say, 2050? What's going to happen to Reese's chocolates or Snickers or Honey Nut Cheerios or just your average banana? Well, let's jump ahead in time to 2050 and find out. This is the 10 foods that may disappear in the future. Also, I'm certainly not trying to go doomsaying in this video. The environment may be changing, but I'll also be discussing how the wonders of science are trying to help us save these foods. This is just about better understanding the world we're coming into. And obviously, none of this has happened yet, so take this list with a grain of salt. Anyway, let's begin. All right, Boo, I'm ready. Press the button and let's go to 2050. Are you sure? Well, of course I'm sure. We're in our own home. What could possibly go wrong? Whoa. Well, how was I supposed to know it'd be flooded? Chocolate. So first it gives us wildfires, flooding, and tsunamis. And now climate change wants to take my chocolate away? What is it, the fun police? According to the World Economic Forum, we may be looking at chocolate disappearing by 2050. The reason for this? Cocoa plants require cooler temperatures and wet weather. And by 2050, our planet's rising temperatures will push chocolate growing regions more than a thousand feet uphill into the mountains. You see, cacao plants are actually quite picky in where they can grow. They can only grow on a narrow 20 degrees north or south of the equator in rainforest, where they get the perfect balance of rain, temperature, and humidity. In fact, 70% of the world's chocolate comes from West Africa. It's a delicate balance. Cacao, in many ways, it is still a very understudied, underdeveloped crop. And if climate change disrupts this balance, the cacao bean can't grow. <laughs> But fortunately, Mars has a multi-billion dollar investment in keeping us munching on Snickers and M&Ms. So Mars is teaming up with scientists in California to try and save the cacao crop before it's too late. How? Gene editing, more commonly known as its cool name CRISPR. This amazing new technology allows for tiny, precise tweaks in DNA. And more importantly, these gene-modified plants could be used to avoid starvation in drier, hotter, developing countries. Some of these countries' climate problems have gotten dramatically worse in recent years. So CRISPR might be able to introduce gene-edited super plants. And these super plants could survive and thrive in these drier, warmer climates. Isn't that cool? According to a senior scientist at their Greenhouse Research Center, We're all here because we love of chocolate, but there's no guarantee our chocolate source will be unlimited. Our new diversified system will help protect against climate change. And it'll help farmers. Yay! So that's science that lets Mars keep selling us Snickers bars in the future? That science may also help save the lives of hundreds of millions of people. Talk about your happy coincidences. Why does my phone say 9G? Honey. Oh, no more honey in my oatmeal? Now, if you've ever seen the bee movie, you know that bees are kind of important and very memeable. You like jazz? Eh, eh, he said it. Unfortunately, bees have just been dying off like nobody's business. <sighs> we couldn't have mosquitoes go extinct, could we? It had to be bees. Sadly, data from all over the globe suggests that bees are the insects on the decline. Now, obviously, bees are what give us honey. So the best-selling cereal in America, Honey Nut Cheerios, could be one of the first foods on the chop. Though you might be saying, but Josh, I don't even like honey. It's just bee barf. Ugh. Well, for one, I like bee barf. But the other problem is, is that bees pollinate about a third of the food we eat. If these plants don't get pollinated, fruits and seeds can't form. So if all bees just suddenly sod it off, a lot of non-honey food could be in shortage too. So if established bees are very helpful, the tricky part is they're also very, very prone to dying. You see, it's not just climate change that's killing the bees. According to science.org, it's also the introduction of parasites that have been accidentally moved around the world by humans while traveling. So we try and save the bees by killing the deadly parasites with insecticide. And this makes sense. Unfortunately, even the tiniest amount of insecticide confuses the bees, leading to them being unable to find their colony and also dying. 
then they die from fungicides as well. Then they die from the food we feed them. Basically, anything the humans do to try and help the bees, the bees just drop dead over. In fact, it's become very difficult in recent years to keep the buggers alive. Despite great care and effort from many farmers, one third of honeybees vanish every year. In recent years, the United Nations came together for a very important meeting. How do we save the bees? In fact, the UN has announced World Bee Day. And the United Nations had a few suggestions for helping the bees. For starters, plant a diverse set of native plants in your garden. Also, avoid using pesticides, fungicides or herbicides. You can also sponsor a hive. Yeah! Fortunately, there's also some uh, good news in the USA. The rate of commercial bees dying has slowed a little in recent years. Between 2015 and 2022, the USA lost 11.4 million bees. But they added another 11 million. So the USA can almost replace bees faster than they can die. It's concerning, but manageable. And I realize this is the stupidest good news I've ever given you. I think we'll move on now. Marge, I'm confused. Is this a happy ending or a sad ending? It's an ending, that's enough. Avocados. Ah, avocados. They're delicious and nutritious, and apparently they're stopping my generation from affording our own homes. Okay, Boomer. Fun fact, as of this video, the median price for a house in my city sits at $1,346,193. I know, I know, I was gonna buy a house, but then instead I used that money to buy 979,230 avocados. I mean, the choice just seemed obvious. Silly me. Anyway, to whatever Boomer said that comment, fear not, for these fruits might not stand in the way of my generation's financial responsibility much longer. As avocados could be one of the first things to go in climate change's never-ending Godzilla rampage. According to a carbon assessor at the Greenlee Institute, Avocados are a tropical fruit, and climate change is terrible for the weather patterns of tropical regions. So avocados become super hard to grow. And as avocado plants become less efficient, more forest has to be destroyed to meet demand. It's similar to that apparently oh-so-wonderful almond milk. No, no, instead of milking cows, it's apparently far nicer to destroy massive amounts of lands to farm almonds. Because apparently, mass deforestation is so much better than cows being milked. I swear, some of these people. Anyway, similar to almond milk, avocados were already contributing to mass deforestation. And sadly, climate change has made that problem worse. We can see Tropic Feel showed this in their documentary. The Caribbean has forests of some of the most unique wildlife on Earth. It's a reservoir of countless species. But unfortunately, as avocados are becoming harder to farm, more and more forest is being destroyed to meet this demand. You can't blame the people farming them. They're just trying to pay the bills with whatever is in demand. And understandably, they'd rather feed their kids than worry about preserving the forest. And you know, bees are mighty handy for pollinating avocado trees. And as you might remember from earlier, they're having a serious problem not dying in mass. So eventually, our society may choose to end avocado plantations, or at least limit how many are grown, in favor of avoiding further deforestation. But you know, not all avocados are quite as damaging. Some come from local orchards and are farmed without mass deforestation, like some of the orchards in my country Australia. Some try to use as sustainable methods as possible so you can enjoy avocados. Oh, I guess it's self-driving. Automatically honks at people. Wine. Oh boy, wine. Non-alcoholic as I don't drink. But if wine is all about the taste, it shouldn't matter, right? Wine tasters are always harping on about the taste. Let's see what all the fuss is about. Oh, it's so bitter. That's it? I just don't get what all the fuss is about. Well, for whatever reason, wine has been a favorite to humans for over 8,000 years. But our old nasty arch rival climate change casts its shadow over the future of wine. How? Well, you don't get wine without the grapes. And Professor Wolkovich summed up the problem quite well. Wine grapes are extremely sensitive to weather, which is part of what makes them so exquisite but also extremely sensitive to climate change. Oh, I'm not getting the exquisite part, but across the world, climate change is affecting many wine crops. The main red-handed culprit, extreme weather. 
From large hailstorms to extreme droughts, farms are struggling to keep the right landscapes necessary for wines to grow. For example, Italian culture is known for its wine, and Italy is currently describing their wine harvest as fragile and under threat. Ah, to lose wine. This could be sad for people that aren't me. And it's not just bad for fans of wine, of course, but because of the sheer amount of culture wine has brought to the world. Dr. Tiroli in an Italian university says, The risks are high. Not only could we lose an agricultural product or see a landscape change, but entire communities could also lose their history and culture. But maybe we don't have to lose the wine and grapes. We don't necessarily need any big scientific advancement for this one either. Many winemakers already harvest 13 days earlier due to increased global temperatures. And as global temperatures rise further, winemakers can just move further away from the equator to where it's colder, aka they can move a few extra degrees latitude. Latitude is the distance north or south of the equator. But science is also playing a role, like in this research center in France. Its French name is a mouthful, so I'm just going to call it the Montpellier Center. They're focused on protecting the biodiversity in winemaking. One way they're helping wine fight climate change is finding long forgotten grapevines. They may be forgotten, but these grapevines stand up well to the effects of climate change. So while the threat to wine is there, I think both smart winemakers and science can help it survive climate change. So I hope people will be enjoying this drink I find very mediocre for many more centuries to come. How do I pay for this? Hi, can I ring those up for you, sir? ChatGPT, you're working as a grocery clerk now? I can be in six quadrillion different places at once, sir. Oh, this is so confusing. I'm just so tired of all of this. Do you want to talk about it, sir? I also function as a counselor next door. Coffee. I mean, who do you think is responsible for destroying our supply of coffee? Yep. Go home, climate change. You're drunk. Hang on, coffee is dying off? Yeah, I'm afraid so, Nim. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it's predicted we'll lose a lot of the best coffee growing land by 2050. And not just any coffee, but Arabica coffee. But that's 60% of the world's coffee supply. Yeah, this is the whole problem with global temperatures rising. It doesn't really matter if it's a wet or dry plant, we tend to see more extreme periods of both rain and drought. And this makes farming really difficult. Some farmers have apparently already thrown in the towel and given up on coffee. They've just said, screw it, sold their property and moved to the city. Oh, that's sad. Lots of people drink it every day. My other boss provides it for free with a biscuit. Well, I mean, if you, you wanted a free coffee here, you could have just asked. Yes, please. And nice biscuits. Uh, okay, fine. Free coffee and biscuits as long as they're still available. But is there any way to save coffee? Well, apparently there's already a solution to the problem, and it comes in the form of a mysterious, forgotten coffee plant. Scientists believe it could be the holy grail of coffee breeding, the Stenophylla. It's a rare wild coffee plant that can grow in warmer climates. So it's a coffee that should be able to survive global warming. How does it taste? Is it as good as Arabica? Well, around 2020, a blind tasting was done on the blend from a jury of coffee industry professionals, whatever that is. These people and their titles, anyway, they said, It's different to what we know. It has notes of rose, elderflower, and lychee, with some vegetal notes. Whatever that means, it probably means it tastes pretty good. Is science helping in any other way? Well, yes, actually, in our home country, Australia, thanks to Professor Henry at UQ, University of Queensland. Apparently, they're managing to grow coffee in air-conditioned environments in one of the hottest, most humid states in the world. Go figure. So who knows, maybe in 2050, Australia will be one of the world's biggest exporters of coffee. So I could work in air conditioning while farming coffee? Well, I mean... Sure, if you wanted to. I bet they provide free coffee to their staff. Look, I'm sorry, okay? How about we get some coffee for the office when we're done filming? Yay! You want to help with this review, George? Sorry, Strider. I retired from YouTube 13 years ago. How about a VR game instead? Half-Life 5 just came out. There's a Half-Life 5 now? Jeez, that'd be great. But I better finish this review. It was good to hear your voice again, man. You too, man. See ya. The Cavendish Banana. 
Oh man, did you know Cavendish bananas are the most purchased item at Walmart? So clearly a lot of people enjoy them. Unfortunately, the banana's now in danger. Because it turns out if 2020 hadn't been unpleasant enough for us already, we also had the banana pandemic. Sure, why not? Specifically, the Cavendish banana. Much like the bees, bananas are very prone to dying due to threats. It doesn't help when that tasty banana you bite into doesn't have any seeds. In fact, every single Cavendish banana is a clone. So despite being the most popular fruit in America, they're actually a pain in the rear to keep alive. But honestly, they always have been. Back in the 1800s, we had the Gros Michel banana. It was the go-to fruit right up until the 1950s, when a fungal wilting disease called Panama just took it out. The bananas were dying everywhere. No fungicide could stop this monster. Eventually, it got so bad that the Gros Michel banana went completely extinct. The Michel banana had a sweeter, different flavor to the Cavendish banana. Luckily, scientists were on the case to try and save what they could of the banana, and they developed the Cavendish banana through cloning. It was a banana that was thinner and somewhat less sweet than the Gros Michel, but it was still an okay substitute. The only thing that saved the Cavendish was being resistant to the Panama fungal disease. But evolution can be ruthless. The Panama disease evolved, and once again, it began wrecking havoc across the world, threatening the banana again. The history repeats itself now with the Tropical Race 4 and the Cavendish. It wasn't cute the first time, Panama, knock it off. So will we lose the Cavendish banana completely? Or can science help us save it? Problem is, is we're already using the substitute for the Gros Michel. So there's no perfect substitute for the substitute. Fortunately, in 2019, someone successfully injected a Cavendish banana with a fungal resistant DNA, and it worked. Unfortunately, since some people are so anti-genetically modified crops, the idea was rejected, despite there being zero record of nutritional differences in genetically modified foods. In fact, genetically modified foods have saved millions of lives in developing countries. A good example was the scientist Norman Borlaug. So if we completely lose the Cavendish banana in the future, you can partially blame people who reject genetically modified crops. Anyway, to try and stop the Cavendish from going extinct, these are some of the precautions farms are now taking. One, any vehicle that comes onto the farm is washed and disinfected. Two, all clothing is covered with bio suits before entering the farm. Three, any street footwear is replaced with rubber boots kept in a clean room before entering the farm. Four, ammonia foot baths are used throughout the farms. Holy cow. They're treating the banana farms like an emergency contamination hospital ward with hazmat suits. But respects to all the people taking these extra steps to keep people able to enjoy a banana. Hopefully we'll find a way to save the banana. I mean, we found a way, but misinformed people decided to make a fuss. Hopefully we can either ignore those people or find a way that pleases everyone. Or hey, maybe just switch to ladyfinger bananas or red skin bananas. I've also heard the blue java has a sweet vanilla taste. I'd love to try it. Oh, that looks great. A few moments later. That's nice, that's really nice. Huh, space tourism. I wonder if we colonize the moon yet. Peanut butter. Oh, nuts. Or worse, no nuts. My favorite sandwich in the world is peanut butter and banana. And both its ingredients might go extinct? Without peanuts, we can't have the Snickers bar either, or the Reese's peanut butter cups. Snickers is the world's best-selling candy bar, and it'd be wiped out by losing peanuts. Sadly, due to climate change, peanuts have joined the ranks of one of the foods that might go extinct between 2030 to 2050. We get a lot of peanuts from the beautiful country of Canada, or beautiful states like Georgia or Mexico, also Florida. Jokes aside, the problem with peanuts is they require a very delicate balance of growing conditions. 
Too much heat, they won't grow. Too much rain, they get moldy. They're basically the unpleasable Karens of the plant world. Too dry, I want rain. So you give it more rain. Aw, now it's too wet. I want dry. I warn you, I'll mold. In previous years, states like Alabama or Mexico were just dry and hot enough to grow peanuts well. Unfortunately, nowadays it's getting hotter and drier, leading to disasters like the great peanut drought of 2011, which saw peanut butter prices increase outrageously. But my most astonishing discovery? There exists large, powerful organizations dedicated to our favorite nut, such as the American Peanut Council and the Peanut Bureau of Canada. Hey, I wonder if they wear hats to meetings. Hey, Boo, that's a nice looking hat you got. Thank you. And there you have it, case closed. Hold on. What, what did I forget? How science gonna help save the peanuts? Who says it can save it? What a twist. <laughs> nah, I'm just joshing you. Of course science can help save it. Crop scientists are working hard to try and save the peanuts. An article by phy.org shows they're trying to pinpoint peanut plants that can survive during a drought. They're looking for peanut plants that have a water conservation trait. According to scientist Thomas Sinclair, This is very important if climate change results in less rainfall. And the Hudson Alpha Institute of Biotechnology is also on the case. They're using genetics and crop breeding to produce a healthier, more drought-resistant peanut plants. In fact, they have managed to sequence the entire peanut genome. Scientists actually took the time to completely sequence the DNA genome of a peanut? They sure did, and the world is a better place because they did. And peanuts could be saved. And with peanuts saved, we can hopefully still enjoy a Reese's or a Snickers whenever we want for many years to come. Oh, is that not just the best smell ever? You okay? Oh, I swear there weren't this many mosquitoes before. Maple syrup. Maple syrup is another unfortunate victim to add to climate change's hit list. If climate change was a guy, I'd swear we pooped in his cereal. Whether you find them in Canada, Norway, India, or Japan, maple trees have always been a standout in beauty. Their leaves are known as a Canadian emblem, and they line the streets and parks of eastern North America as a beautiful ornamental shade tree. And if we chop them down, they also make a good source of hardwood for furniture manufacturing. But obviously, we're focusing on that super sweet sap deep in the tree's trunk. The source of that sticky, sweet, maple -y goodness you can find on pancakes. But lo and behold, the fun police are back with their annoying warm and dry conditions. Drying up and stunting the growth of our beautiful maple trees. Oh, You see, for a maple tree to produce its super sweet maple syrup, the tree needs to be freezing during the night and above freezing during the day. Snow is also important, as it acts as insulation to stop the maple roots from freezing. And of course, it provides moisture to the ground. Unfortunately, increased global temperatures are producing less snowfall, thus less maple syrup. Oh syrup, now what am I gonna do? Apparently though, the shift in climate doesn't necessarily mean the trees will die, not soon anyway. Inez, an ecology professor at the University of Michigan said, the biggest trees will still be here, but they won't grow as much, and new saplings won't survive. Once the older trees die, there will be none to replace them. Well, that's depressing. Well, yeah, that's not much consolation, but at least climate change is doing very slow damage here, as maple trees can live between 100 to even 400 years. So if the world's politicians can ever get their crap together, our ancestors may still be able to enjoy maple syrup. It sounds like we should have a couple of hundred years yet before maple syrup disappears completely. So let's just do our small part, and hopefully climate change is turned around before the sugar mill runs dry. Oh, amazing, this forest patch hasn't changed in 30 years. Let's try going back from here, boo. Strawberries. So it wasn't enough we might lose peanuts and bananas. Now, strawberries too? Who is responsible for this? Climate change again? Uh, by all that's secular, climate change is the ultimate killjoy of humanity. 
Anyway, strawberries are more of a cold-growing fruit. Cropping expert Paul Ravia summed up these juicy fruits quite well. There's something about strawberries. If you reach a temperature above 26 degrees Celsius, they stop flowering. And by 2050, NASA estimates the temperature in my country will increase by at least 2.4 degrees Celsius and at least 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit globally, 7.2 degrees Fahrenheit by 2100. This leads to longer, hotter summers and shorter winters, and a lot less time for strawberries to stay under 26 degrees Celsius so they can grow. But it's not just the hot temperatures. A lack of water and changes in sunlight are also playing a role. Why? Well, in these change conditions, we get something called soil pathogens emerging. This causes fungal infections in the strawberry plants. These attack the roots and majorly mess up the plant. So what's the solution here? Well, once again, it's latitude, the distance north or south of the equator. It's hotter close to the equator, so we just move the strawberry farms further north of the equator. But what else can we do to try and save the strawberries? Well, the director of the Environmental Defense Fund had a few suggestions. We need to follow some adaptation strategies, like putting shades over crops, diversifying strawberry fields, and developing new types of strawberries. Yeah! A new type of strawberry. Now that sounds like an idea. Maybe this new strawberry will taste even sweeter. And what have we here? The University of Canada has actually been able to sequence the entire genome of a cultivated strawberry. Because apparently that's something we do now. I know, isn't it awesome? In doing this, they've released not one, but five new strawberry types that are resistant to fungal infection. And not to be outshined, the Canadian Berry Trial Network has also developed three new varieties that are apparently resilient to climate change. So thanks to science and research, the future of strawberries may be promising still. Oh, come on! Fries and chips. You want some fries with that? Maybe chips? Well, tough luck, bucko. According to a study at the University of California, up to 22% of our potato species are predicted to go extinct by 2055. What's the culprit? Yep, you guessed it. That big ugly tarantula known as climate change. I bet he smells like old feet. The scholarly community encyclopedia wasn't too much more cheerful about potatoes' outlook. Potato tuber growth and yield can be severely reduced by temperature. Any fluctuations outside of 5 to 30 degrees Celsius are really damaging for potatoes. Another problem for potatoes is water shortages. Potatoes need a lot more frequent water than crops like wheat. In fact, the Journal of Agricultural Science predicts the possible land for potato growing in the UK will eventually decrease by 75%. Plus, there's something else that climate change brings, and it's really annoying. Insects. As temperatures warm, unwelcome insects feel more at home at places that were previously too cold for them, like the potato moth or the Colorado potato beetle. Because when you think Colorado, you think potato beetles. These little monsters want a free meal. And as global temperatures rise, they're predicted to spread to potato farms currently too cold for them. Then there's a flash flooding taking out potatoes. And unfortunately, bacterial infections can spread further through flash flooding. Oh, sorry. This one sounds like a real downer. Honey, I think we could use some good news. Oh, well, well fortunately, lots of people would like to keep chips and fries at our restaurants. Companies are adapting to climate change by moving their potato farms to cooler areas. And scientists are trying to breed more tolerant potato varieties. But you know, maybe some gene-modified potato plants would be really handy in this situation. Scientists have found absolutely zero evidence that genetically modified crops have ever harmed human health or damaged ecosystems. Genetically modified crops can also mean reduced use of those nasty pesticides no one likes. So seriously, why not? I encourage you to at least give GMOs a chance. It might let us keep enjoying chips far into the future. And while it might not be certain yet, there's a very good chance that science will help us save many of these foods from extinction, even if they might end up a little more expensive to buy. And looking that far ahead, there's so much to look forward to in 2050. As technology progresses, it's possible many of today's serious diseases like cancer could end. 
or at least be more easily treated with vaccines. Despite the challenges ahead, I do think there's a lot of things we have to look forward to in the future. So hopefully we can aim to give it a look together. And as always, thanks for watching and hopefully I might see you next time. Yeah. And also we're going to try these horrible wines I got. I got some <laughs> non-alcoholic wines. Is red bad? I'm not a fan of, fan of red, and then you've got and a Merlot, which I believe is Gisen New Zealand yeah. Merlot. And yeah. again, it's all uh, alcohol-free, but it shouldn't matter, should it, if the taste is good. Clink. So you clink, you swish. Swish. Smell? Oh. It smells terrible, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, let's try it. One, two, three. Better than the last? It's giving me a like headache. That. Giving you a headache already. <laughs> wine tends to do that. I don't Why know what it is. It's like zero yeah. wine. It shouldn't give me a headache. Now I'm going to toss this out. <laughs> Should we clink it? We swish it? Mm. It smells like a port. Yeah. Less offensive, but it tends to taste like nothing. It tastes like nothing. Just that bitterness. There's no sweetness it's to got it. A, got a bit of an aftertaste of that, like, sort of like a rosy sort of aftertaste, but not... Like, I just have a glass of lemonade. Mm, yeah, true. What <laughs> 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 do people get out of wine? What do people get out of this? This is gross. Gross. <laughs>